Greetings, comrades, and welcome to the eastern border. Sorry for uh, not being on for a while. I just took the slow time on the front to recuperate a bit, get myself back in order. You know, all this travel and going to Poland and teaching those kids, it exhausted me a lot. It wasn't a nice uh, thing. Like, I enjoyed talking with the kids and everything. Well, college students, but still, you know, old enough to be able to call them kids. But, uh, hey, you know, all the nice things have to come to an end at one point and uh, kind of have to get <laughs> get back to work. understood that because two important things happened in these past days. And uh, one of them, you know, the mobilization in Russia that's apparently, well, stopped for a while. And I'll get to that. It's a bit more philosophical because um, upon commenting on that, yeah, I've been seeing that more and more Russian commentators that I follow are um, coming out with the very same idea that I've been saying for years. And uh, I think that people in the West should also pay attention to it. I'm talking about the potential damage that has that, that Putin has done to the unity of Russia. It's at this point, especially in the context of mobilization, becoming very obvious so that, well, even people who are very conservative in their remarks and kind of naive about how a potential great Russia can look like are now taking that into account as a very real thing that could happen as a realistic option. And uh, we'll get to that, but apparently it's, you know, in two out of three cases, you know, and that's that's from the naive people who kind of hope to keep everything together again. But the big thing that happened today, because I want to get to that mobilization and philosophy stuff a bit later on, but the, the big thing happened is that the largest drone strike on Russia since the start of the war happened. 16 drones attacked Black Sea fleet at the port of Sevastopol today. In the morning of October 29th, nine flying unmanned craft and seven, uh, mm, as they're called, autonomous marine unmanned devices, so basically just subnautical drones, I suppose, attacked Black, she Black Sea fleet ships and anchored the city. Seven of the 16 drones were shot down. The Defense Ministry reports that the Marine minesweeper Ivan Golubets and a floating battery sustained minor damage. However, we've uh, seen some other things, but yeah, on with that. The Ministry called the attack terrorism. It also says that fighters from the 73rd Special Naval Center of the Ukrainian Navy carried out the attack and uh, allegedly uh, under the guidance of British specialists located in the city of Ohayivk in the Mykolaiv region. And, um, yeah, well, see, I also kind of think that the British specialists weren't chosen uh, accidentally since, since there's a belief in, in Russia about the might of the British Secret Service. And uh, they like to blame the Anglo-Saxon on everything. And, uh, you know, they're testing out the whole political instability in the UK right now. Because in the response to this attack, Russia indefinitely suspended its participation in a deal concerning the export of Ukrainian grain through the Black Sea. So, yeah, the harsh famine that we were supposed to be avoiding in, you know, the uh, countries that very much rely on this grain being shipped there... Yeah, that's coming back on the menu, sadly. The Ministry of Defense justified this whole decision thing, again, pushing the world a bit closer to a bit larger catastrophe, saying that, uh, quote, warships and civilian boats involved in ensuring the security of the Great Corridor were affected by the attack. I, uh, I do believe that's a, that's a lie, though, but, you know, they're, they have to blame it on the British so that they can cancel the deal and, you know, poke poke whatever is going to rule the UK for, I hope, more than a head of lattice for the foreseeable future to test the waters, so to speak. Very normal action by any Soviet or Russian leader. You know, they have to prod the opposition just to see how they would react, you know. And, of course, well, this uh, thing about the attack, yeah, that's... Um, Moscow's just using some pretext to block the grain corridor. Uh, also, you know, stated by Ukrainian official side, and I tend to agree to them. Sevastopol occupation government governor Mikhail Ravnozhayev called today's attack the largest attack on Russia since the end of the war, since the start of the war. After the incident, Ravnozhayev, as uh, as Russian governors do, also threatened people who posted videos of similar incidents on the internet. According to him which is amazing, Ukrainian armed forces can obtain information about Sevastopol's defense systems from the clips. 
quote, special services will deal with the individual clips that allow, that allow the enemy to detect city's defense systems, he stated. And uh, apparently he also said that the city's residents will no longer be able to receive broadcasts from the city's surveillance cameras. Yeah, and this comes um, comes a day after after they seriously stated that uh, NATO is now spreading infected, um, and that this was in the UN with their uh, governor, with, with their kind of representative there, Nibenja. Russia claims that the United States is spreading infected mosquitoes in, in Ukraine and, and infecting Russian soldiers. Uh, yeah, I guess that was the previous pretext. After you know all the situation, this is just this is just crazy. And, uh, and yeah, and I mentioned this because, hey, I'm not talking about this, but, uh, well, Natalia Gumenyuk, the head of press office for Ukraine's Southern Command on, on, on the Ukrainian side, stated that whilst, there, whilst there, there is no official confirmation, there is a clear understanding that fear of combat insects and the use of aggressive air defense systems against them might produce a backlash. And yeah, again, that refers to Nibenja, who mentioned uh, mentioned to say this uh, uh, like crazy uh, uh, in the United Nations. Also, of course, there were um, there were some other comments about this in the happenings of Astapol. Ukrainian armed forces posted on their Telegram channels that um, apparently the frigate Admiral Makarov, which became the Black Sea Fleet's flagship after the loss of Moskva, had been damaged. But the information needs additional confirmation, it said. And I will also, you know wait a bit on the confirmation uh, because a lot of people are already going super happy about um, about this whole happening on, on Twitter, but Twitter tends to be overtly too much optimistic. And uh, yeah, according to the official ministry, oh, this is crazy. Mm. Representatives, this is from Russia again, representatives of a British naval unit located in the city of, of, of Chai of Ukraine took part in planning, supplying and implementing a terrorist attack in the Baltic Sea on September 26th to blow up the Nord Stream 1 and 2 gas pipelines. This this also happened at the same time and all this stuff, because Anglo-Saxons are responsible for everything. If only there was an actual Anglo-Saxon alive today who could, you know, defend his people or something. Because, because this is just crazy. And that, yeah, you, Russia felt kind of, you know, couldn't rule everything and couldn't advance on the deal. So now they're cutting this off. And again, who who knows who exploded this? It's probably Ukraine blowing them up and then Russia just using this as an excuse. And Ukraine probably most likely targeted those, you know, bigger, more important ships to conduct some of their own operations. Uh, likely, but I can't confirm this. So I'm just saying likely here. Uh, I'm not Reuters, who somehow claimed Ksenia Sobchak was a major opposition leader when she was just sanctioned opposition, or or stuff that I really don't know. Because, well, yeah, I, I, I'm still unsure about all the explosion stuff and, and Western sources here. But, yeah, you know, it's it's pretty pretty likely that they, they, they were just going to use, if not this, then anything else to exit the grain deal. Because Putin felt, you know, someone had cheated him. And he can't allow that. Because, you know, cheating on this matter is, um, well, only allowed for Putin himself, in in his mind at least. And in between the news, you know, stuff that uh, goes also in the news section here, Russians apparently are, are spending more on antidepressants than ever before. According to Russia's Center for Development of Advanced Technologies, which is already a funny name, I, I really don't know what, what they invent, I guess more Kalashnikovs or something, but um, expenditures on antidepressants in the first nine months of, of 2022 were 70% higher than the same period of 2021. Interestingly enough, in total, money, the money that Russians spent on antidepressants this year was approximately 5 billion rubles, or 81.1 million. In terms of quantity, antidepressant package sales increased by 48%. Russians had bought a total of 8.4 million packages of antidepressant, uh, antidepressants this year as of September 30th. Now, um, the biggest buyers of antidepressants were residents of Moscow, St. Petersburg, and the rest of Moscow region. This is going to get important when I get to the mobilization, too. This ties together with stuff. And apparently, well, yeah, you know, Muscovites, at least the ones who can afford it and who are not not ashamed to, you know, overcome the traditional stigma of mental illness in Russia, which is a big issue and, you know, should probably deserve their, its own episode. But obviously, not being normal is a thing that's frowned upon in Russia. Yeah, they're, they're buying antidepressants. 
But um, again, that was the cities. Moscow, where salaries are three times the, the, the country's average. And Petersburg, the second great city, you know. Yeah, this all comes together. In Moscow, people are buying antidepressants. In regions, the poorer the region, the, the less ethnically Russian it is, people are dying there. And uh, one of the interesting comments that I heard today was from a source that, you know, sometimes I disrespect on Twitter, but uh, he, he mentions some of the good stuff out there. A lot of Ukrainians don't like him because they call him a hidden imperialist. You know, he's one of those Russian liberals, but he made a good point there. He was coming from the wrong, wrong position, but his arguments were really good. I'm talking about Maxim Katz. He's also on a wanted list in Russia as well. And what he said today, he compared this whole situation to the situation before, uh, you know, 1905. If you listen to Mike Duncan's Revolution series, you will know about the whole, you know, pre-revolution in 1905. That was the result of the Russo-Japanese War. Now, the thing is, throughout all the 19th century, uh, Finland was the most calm and uh, organized province of the whole Russian Empire. It was autonomous. It had the, it had one of the first parliaments on the planet, and it had a, its own constitution. It it didn't have to conscript soldiers uh, to the central army. It didn't pay like that much in taxes. They had some tariffs. It was, it was fairly autonomous, and uh, you know what Russia gained from it was Tsarist Russia gained from it was extra territory and, ex- and access to the Baltic Sea, and you know Finland got a huge protector that no one could invade it. You know like Sweden and such, but then. One of the glorious, mind-bendingly weird decisions by, by the czars was that let's Russify this thing. And they sent a major named Bobrikov to kind of Russify the whole thing, turn everyone to Russian and impose taxes and, you know, do a lot of stringent measures. And then, like, that happened in 1898. And in about, you know, four to five years, maybe six at some point, they have turned this, this the most peaceful province throughout the whole 19th century into a... Uh, into a massive, massive time bomb, which was one of the countries that left the Russian Empire, as we did in the Baltics, following, you know, all the uprisings and everything in 1918. And right now, well, I'm just mentioning this because Maxim Katz is usually the guy who always speaks about building the beautiful, nice future after Putin. He's the kind of guy, you know, that if if he would produce content in English, I'm pretty sure that, you know, credible sources like New York Times and, and other more hopeful, idealistic uh, Western agents would definitely, definitely quote, because he speaks about the Russia's potential of becoming a democratic country and everything. So today, his um, his stuff that he said makes kind of a turning point. He says now the same thing that I've said for many, many years, that my, as I consider him, mentor Alexander Nevzorov has also pointed out, and that recently, at the beginning of the war, even Khodorkovsky, which you should know if you listen to this show. I mean, I've quoted him, and he's the oligarch that sat 10 years in prison because Putin wanted his oil company, and then he, you know, mig- migrated to the UK very much against Putin. You know, one of the few credible actual leaders of the opposition, that I could say. Uh, yeah, they've all been mentioning about this. And now Maxim Katz, who's kind of a more mainstream Russian opposition guy, again, a bit naive, but... Uh, decent dude, he now spoke about the situation where in the mobilization, the country's back into this whole, into this whole, you know, multiple government system, as it seems that it currently, as he stated, there is no border between Vladimir district and Moscow yet, yet it feels like one can actually fully emigrate from that district to Moscow. See, there's Moscow, and there's a bit lower St. Petersburg, then there's a bit lower the regional capitals, and then there's everyone else. And the poorer and the more ethnic, like less ethnically Russian you are, the harder your situation is. That's the problem, because a lot of people feel this unease. And previously, you know, Putin had created this system where this whole supposedly federation had, was run by absolutely like a, the colonial machine. I really, I've really said this a lot of times. Russia is basically a colonial empire, and Putin has centralized everything because the governors they're appointed by Putin. But due to how the system works, local governors they're not elected. Well, not in any real election, anyways. They were formally not elected also for a while, but then you know Putin turned back the elections. Except he also made them a complete sham, as everywhere. But uh, at the same time. At the same time, they also have no real power. They're basically, because everything is controlled by the federal government constantly, the police, the the whole industries, everything, and the regions themselves, you know, they have to be, you know, dotated, like they have to be given money from Moscow to basically survive. And that's the kind of 
the carrot thing because Moscow's taken away their resources and because every business pays taxes only in Moscow or very few in St. Petersburg. So they just give them back their money. And previously it was like, you know, if you disobey Moscow and have some, you know, liberties and do, do stuff that you want to do, then you won't get the money and Moscow might send someone really bad at your position who has a bit of control, but mostly the governor's position in those various regions of Russia is just basically stealing more money because that's where their real authority lies in. So that's been weird. But right now, you know, I just remembered the interview with the Dagestani protesters that I that I did, and and I uh, I posted up in a lot of places, and they stated the the most important part about the whole situation: the fact that um, Putin is Russia, but Caucasus is Caucasus, Siberia is Siberia, that everyone's living locally, and it's becoming more and more true. Since well, right now, even though there was still a lot of racism in Russia, and We've seen numerous videos about people from these eastern regions like Tuva and Buryati and Tatarstan. They all just went out and complained about how um, how they've been treated unequally and how they've been treated as a second-class citizen. You know, all those famous signs about we, re- we rent this apartment only to people who look Slavic enough. And then a Pole tried to apply and apparently he wasn't Slavic enough. So what's a Slav? Yeah, uh, that's by the way a question that I answered recently in a documentary that I was in. That's going to be out at some point. It's going to be interesting. Um, I hope to be able to share it with you in some format as well. But right now, it turns out that uh, looks in the eyes of many people, because a lot of reports about some previously maybe not even existing, but in a lot of cases pre-existing independence movements and separatist movements trying to organize. And these guys are getting armed. Why? Because think about it. In Moscow, currently, according to reports, not much has changed pre-war. You know, Moscow lives by the normal standards. Meanwhile, the whole villages in Buryatia and poor regions where basically zero ethnic Russians live. Yeah, there, there, there are ports and villages where literally every male person was mobilized. Everyone. Out of the 79 males living in a village of like 200 people, all of them were, were sent to sent to army. Meanwhile, in Moscow and St. Petersburg, the biggest metropolis cities, they got off easy. There you can just go to your coffee shops and enjoy your Apple products and whatnot. Well, quite illegal, illegal Apple products, but, you know, still, life's pretty okay. At the same time, again, the situation in the poorer countryside is getting more harmful. People are dying there. This is why the protests were in Dagestan, not anywhere else, because in Moscow people still live mostly drinking antidepressants, as we as we, as we we saw last in the last segment. But, um, but also they, you know, a lot of them who have bought into this Putin's propaganda, still believe life is normal. I've read reports about, you know, wives and mothers actually encouraging their their sons and, and, and husbands to go to this war because they think, you know, they're going to return home as heroes, they're going to get pensions, all this good stuff. They believe that stuff. But that's, that belief is in the central government again and, and the fact that Putin's pushed this whole thing and for a reason this whole thing was called an ethnic genocide at the beginning and I believe them. It's a way how to destroy the minorities and they're starting to understand that. That's why the protests in Dagestan were so strong, because in there, the economical situation is so bad that the government is pushing you to go into these, you know, military services to serve, serve all the situation. So the guys who were mobilized in Dagestan, their, their brother, brothers and relatives, they were all already, you know, a lot of them were into the war, and they saw the horrors, and they knew what, that they were going to be sent into the fray, which they are. And, uh, and yeah, so they, they protested, obviously. But in Moscow, no such thing happened. And and it seems that the big protest thing that are happening, you know, in the capital and everything, Putin's doing everything that he can to ensure that a palace coup doesn't happen, that he's not thrown over on the Moscow streets. But this just means that he's actively pushing for a situation where the periphery could uh, just push away from it, from the center as well. Putin might even, you know, if, if this war goes on for long enough and he might just hold on in, onto power... And, you know, not die in the process, because that's also a possibility. There might be a situation where Russia is just too busy, where the regions are just actively trying to push away from it, and Russia has no resources to stop it. And also, secondly, if Putin, you know, leaves, then uh, then, there's this, then there's this other option that the, the government, after Putin, is going to have to deal with such immense amounts of problems that, yeah, it just will have no time or resources to invest in keeping the whole, you know, Humpty Dumpty from falling apart. Now, there are three scenarios that Maxim Kotz put it, and and he really did this better than I have done 
in the past. He said that the first one is what everyone expects, the civil war, very likely. Again, each of these opportunities is one third of a, of a chance of happening. I give it a bit more, but you know, it's it's me. I'm I'm cynical. But uh, first civil war, where you know whatever government beat Putin's rump state, where people still are somehow holding on to him on Moscow, and Moscow doesn't care because it's been put into this position, just you know tries to fight back, and regions are pulling pushing away. Second one is just that, what I just mentioned: some government shift that it doesn't have the resources or basically the ability to kind of put them, kind of separate them together. And we're talking about the periphery stuff, the, the, the big re- ethnic republics, all that stuff. And the final one, the third one, which also is the best scenario for Russia, which I don't think will happen, since that's the scenario that a bit naive Maxim Katz wants to happen, and Khodorkovsky really hopes he'll achieve, I'm doubtful about his successes, is a true federalization, you know, in the sense of the United States. Now, the trick is, I don't know how do you turn... Russia into a federative, truly federative country. That just seems a bit weird. And all this comes into a nice little context, because once again, Putin has, you know, used the Bratva language, the language of criminals and thieves and everything, because he's always very careful with wording. See, the thing is, yesterday, Russian Defense Minister Shoigu told Putin mobilization is complete. Well, not exactly. Russia, uh, Russia doesn't work that way. See, mm mm-mm. I will quote you him directly. Today, we completed the dispatch of citizens who were called up. Notification of citizens has stopped and no additional tasks are planned. The task you set, 300,000 people, is complete. We have no additional tasks planned. Now, a lot of newspapers and media state that this means that the Russian Defense Minister Shoigu tells Putin mobilization is complete. The thing is, in this direct quote of what Shoigu said to Putin, did you hear the words mobilization is complete? No, 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 no. It's the task you set with the implication within mobilization is complete. This uh, basically this basically means that, um, yeah, there are no waves and everything, but uh, there is no also order of Putin, ukaz, as they're called in Russian, to end the mobilization. The task is complete, but uh, just as well, might as well be, that, you know, in November the 1st, the regular, regular, you know, conscription service starts for the winter. They, they have two ones, one in the April, one's in, one's in November. And after that ends, Putin just might come out from the regular one that calls on you for a year, then you serve, then, you know, all that stuff. Putin at any point may come out and declare, oh yeah, let's do another task in this mobilization. Why? Because, again, a presidential ukaz was given, it was never recalled. So, another thing that a lot of media are, with poor knowledge of Russian, I presume, would be using to state that everything's over now. No, it isn't. I don't believe it is. And uh, neither do some regional governors, because I'm pretty sure that uh, somewhere out there, they're going to still do this stuff. Although, you know, not to make Putin look bad right now, there are some regions that in, in Siberia who clearly haven't done their things, and they're going to be in bigger trouble if they continue this whole operation. But it's a weird weird wording here. You know, if Putin had said, you know, if Shoigu had said in the official manner that mobilization is done, and then there would be an official order, documents signed, stamps put in places where stamps were put, all that stuff, then I would believe this. But uh, the task of getting 300,000 people is apparently done. According to Shoigu, by the way, uh, 82,000 mobilized men were sent to the special military operation already. Let me remind you, mobilization started on 21st of September. And already about, you know, a quarter, a bit more than a quarter of of the guys are sent there. Imagine what this does for everything, because I really don't think that uh, they were, you know, trained that well in this short amount of time. Another 218,000 are in training at educational centers and training grounds, also known as trying to not be trained or everything, which is just crazy. Like, really crazy, since, uh, yeah, less than a month of a training. And we already know that they were under-equipped and they had a lot of issues. Uh, by the way, uh, if you saw that video going around on Twitter about, like, about 30 people, or 35 or something, from the regions, again, uh, basically complaining that they were basically thrown onto the front lines uh, without any equipment and training, well, two days later, after they made this video about how they're about to be sent to the front lines and massacred, they were sent to the front lines and were massacred. Out of them, about 13 now live. 
Then we've also had some cases where people who were supposed to be in training basically got just a day's worth of training after all their paperwork was done. And now we have like calls that have called their families and stated that, yeah, out of my unit, only 10 people remained. And even my officer was a lieutenant. He was conscripted himself. No one knew what to do. We have people surrendering. Yeah, there's a there's a bloodbath. Like I said, it would happen. It again did hate to be right in this case. And yeah, to be able to talk about such things, sometimes I just needed a break, like an actual vacation stuff bit. Get, get my life in order again as well. But uh, yeah, fun times. Uh, by the way, long form episode is also incoming. I still haven't forgotten that. I want to, you know, release at least one of this. But there are two other interesting facts about this whole operation. The average age of reservists who were called up is 35. Not 25, 35. Which means that there are people about my age. Yeah, being called up. And this is also interesting. Another thing is that, um, if you remember, Russia has a lot of state employees. However, the mobilized stuff, apparently, quote, during, uh, this is another quote from, um, quote from, uh, basically, uh, Shoigu. I don't know why he mentions this, but still it's interesting. During the course of partial mobilization, we called up and assigned to units more than 1,300 representatives of governmental organs of various levels. That is like deputies, clerks, all that stuff. Basically, he talks about higher-ups. And this is fun. And more than 20, 27,000 employees of private businesses. Imagine what this does to your little, small or medium business if your employee, who you know, probably care about and want to do his job, gets called up. So much for support of small and medium business and how much Russia values its businessmen. I mean, technically on paper, I'm running a small business. And yeah, if my editor got conscripted or me... Uh, I'd be in big trouble. So, it's not very healthy. Then again, disproportionately, well, all these representatives come from the periphery and the regions. This is kind of crazy and weird. Because, again, Putin's scary times, and let me remind you that technically Putin's going to run through another fake election campaign because he loves doing those, and in 2024 there's another election, and officially, you know, he usually starts running these things 18 months before, so we have another half year or something, but... It's coming, and they're planning for it. I wonder what he'll make up this time. What he'll present this some victory or something. It's going to be a bit weird. Life is weird right now. Not easy, definitely. But, yeah. I truly predict some interesting things happening in Russia. The troubles. Take two, as I like to call it. But, yeah. That's up for the future. Thank you for listening, comrades. And, uh, you know, до свидания, товарищ. And remember, happiness is mandatory. And of course, if you like the show, please consider becoming our patron on patreon.com slash Eastern Border. And, you know, we charge per episode, like five to four episodes each month. And uh, yeah, if you, you know, want to make a one-time donation, also very much appreciated. We'll get us some new equipment. I really want that second monitor. I haven't gotten around to, to getting it. Probably should, should uh, use some time tomorrow to do so. And then you can go to easternborder.lv and click the donate button there. And I'm back, and things are happening. Apparently, more optimistic people are again claiming that, um, yeah, Ukraine is going to do some achievements very soon. They claim, you know, a few weeks from now on. In six weeks, apparently, the whole Kherson Oblast needs to be retaken. They evacuated 70,000 people and all that, whatnot. I wouldn't be that happy, but the um, situation is getting weird. And the conscripts, well, they are under-trained and under-equipped, and their effectiveness is very low. And they are from the regions. And let me remind you that, um, again, if Putin's sending all these people from the regions, ethnic ones, to die, then they're also the ones with guns that are going to come over home after the war and be very, very angry. But yeah, okay, this is the final time, and well, good good on you if you, you know, skipped over the first ending, which didn't turn out to be an ending. <sighs> ah, a bit silly like that. Now for the final time. Das vidanje tevarishi. And remember, happiness is mandatory.